Today we're at Crooked Creek Beef in Franklin County. Today you're gonna learn about beef production, all about cows, heifers, steers, and everything in between. The motto of this company is from conception to consumption, and today you're gonna learn exactly what that means. We're here today with Bill McLaren, the owner and operator of Crooked Creek Beef. Uh, Bill, thanks for having us on your farm and getting uh, to talk to us today about beef cattle. Um, first off, I want you to tell us a little bit about the farm that we're standing at today. Well, I don't follow directions well, so okay. first of all, I want to say thank you for doing this and thank you for coming, and we appreciate you being here, and we love talking about, about beef and cattle to young people. So this farm is 310 acres. It's right on the Merrimack River. It's about 35 uh, miles west of downtown St. Louis, so we raise cows about as close to St. Louis as you can get. There's about 100 mm. mother cows or females that are pregnant on this farm. It works out that we can keep about three, uh, one cow per three acres is kind of the way it works. We have three, three other farms that we have cattle on, so we have a total of about 300 females. This, uh, this farm has some purebred Herefords. One of our other farms has purebred Angus, and the other two have crossbred commercial cows. What makes a farmer choose what type or what breed of cow that they, they want to have? Uh, you know, it, it's really controlled by the environment you're going to exist in. So, the, the, and what your end use is. So we do two different things. We produce seed stock for other farmers, and we also finish beef cattle for consumption into the St. Louis metropolitan market. So that's what Crooked Creek Beef actually does. Its part is to, we sell beef. Good. You mentioned seed stock. Can you explain what seed stock is? Seed stock would be the mothers and the fathers that are used to produce the next generation, which will be harvested for human consumption. Perfect. So behind me, I'm seeing um, we have a lot of babies and we have um, mostly red babies, but we have black and red mamas. Can you kind of walk us through the genetics and how that plays a part into what we're seeing? Well, there, there's one Angus baby here. There's one black baby and, and she did not have the calf at the right time at the other farm. So she got moved here. She was actually three months later having a calf than she should have been. Uh, the gestation period of a, of a cow is about 280 days, and that's breed dependent. Different breeds have different gestation lengths by, by a few days. Uh, the rest of these are all purebred Her Hereford calves. So they're purebred Hereford calves out of some purebred Hereford mothers and out of a lot of crossbred Black Angus Hereford cows. So the, the black white faces are or a Hereford Angus cross. I'd like to say half and half, but yeah. they're a cross. So the white face is a dominant genetic marker. If in the cross of those two animals, the white face will come through most of the time. The black is a dominant color. So if you cross a black cow and a red cow, black is a dominant color. So three fourths of those crosses would be black. Mm -hmm. These are all purebred Herefords. Mm -hmm. So they're embryo calves. They, and what an embryo calf is, we've gotten an egg from a donor cow and we've put into these cows to carry the pregnancy. And most of these calves are, I, I can't say, they're brothers, they're full brothers and sisters. So they're not twins, they're not triplets. I don't know what you get up to to be the number of about 30, but they're 30, 30 identical siblings. So it'd be like, I have two sisters. We have the same mom and dad, it's the same thing. It's just that they were born through different... Um, different mother, different, different host mothers carried them. Host mothers, okay, perfect. And so, you know, when you talk about these are embryo calves, how does the calf know whose mom it is? Because we see that they, they just know, they go to that mama, but how do they know that? You know, I, I will tell you as I get off subject a lot, one of the most amazing things is to walk across the cow pasture about sunset and see a new calf being born. Um, the mother doesn't have any hands. She can't help that calf get up. That calf 
by nature has to know to get up and nurse that mother. So she can't dry the calf off. She actually licks that calf to get it dry and to get it, its hair to start fluffing up where it can stay warm. In the process of licking that calf, there's a maternal bond that's made there that's just absolutely amazing. I, I mean, it's, it, it's almost a religious experience to watch that calf that's just be born within 30 minutes can stand and go to its mother and nurse. And that, that bond is formed in the first, first hour of that calf's life and it, it lasts for a very long time. Mm. And they, they even, you'll see, see six month old calves, their mothers will still be licking them and grooming them. Yeah. It's obvious that you're really passionate about these animals and that this is like your passion project and, and what you're doing for a living. But what's your favorite part of raising cattle from conception to consumption? Oh, I like it all. <laughs> I, I, to start with, I really enjoy genetics. I enjoy the, uh, the looking and how can we could develop the best animal and, and truly the best animals for our consumption, right? Yeah. I mean, if we're not going to consume that beef, that, that animals doesn't have a place in, in, in our farm. So we really want to develop an animal that, that has a, 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 it needs to be efficient so we're the best for the environment we can be. Mm -hmm. It needs to be nutritious. It needs to be best for its consumer. And it needs to taste good when we when we consume it. So all those genetic all those are genetic markers that we can can observe and use to pick for the animal. So I really like that first part of it. Um, I really enjoy understanding how a ruminant animal works in our environment. You know, a ruminant animal is just an absolute gift. We can't. You and I can't eat this fescue grass and survive on it. The only, uh, only a ruminant animal or a horse can eat this fescue grass and survive on it. it it's nothing but cellulose. And, and for an animal to be able, for that rumen, that three compartment stomach, to be able to, to, to take this grass and digest it and turn it into a high quality protein is an absolutely amazing thing. It's, it, it, it's just, it's very environmentally conscious. A cow is an upcycler. So what, I, what does it mean, and I'm, I'm going in the wrong You're way good. here. You're good. But a, a cow can take nutrients that we can't consume or maybe left over from what we consume. So when you eat white bread, it says vitamins and minerals added. Mm -hmm. you, they've, taken, they, they've taken parts of that, that wheat out to make the, the starch, the flour for the white bread. What's left over, we feed to the cows. Yeah. Years ago, my grandma milked cows and they called it bran and shorts. We call it wheat mids now, but we upcycle those things. We upcycle the, the gluten, which is what's left over from making high fructose corn syrup. So all these processes that are used for human consumption, what's left over that, that we can't consume a ruminant can consume and turn into protein. So I like that part of it very much too. But I guess uh, I really enjoy looking at that steak on a plate <laughs> and, and looking at that and knowing that we're going to enjoy the fruit of our labor. What's your favorite cut of steak? I guess uh, a, a ribeye. Can't really beat a ribeye, can you? No, it's pretty tough. <laughs> You mentioned a ruminant animal. Can you explain what makes cattle ruminants and what are some other ruminant animals? Well, a, a ruminant is, is a, an animal that has a three compartment stomach. So it's got an, a, a, an abomasin, a mason, and a reticulum. And in that stomach, they are able to process cellulose and turn it into, uh, basically they tear the the, the proteins, the amino acids apart and put them back together to be usable in their rumen. Uh, buffalo, deer, sheep, goats, elk, those are all ruminant animals. And, and like I said, they're absolutely amazing that they're able to take a low quality cellulose and turn it into a high quality protein. Yeah. Now we are joined with Cody Meyer, the farm manager here at Crooked Creek Beef. Um, Cody, thanks for coming out and, and doing this video with us. Can you tell us a little bit about what your job responsibilities are here on the farm? So my job as, as farm manager here, um, 
pretty much pertains to the day-to-day -day care for the animals, um, along with uh, planning rotational grazing, along with um, hay in the summer and fence maintenance and um, anything and everything in between. So, but the majority of it is is the day-to-day. -day. So. What what led you to want to work like as a farm manager? So I grew up on a farm and I always loved doing anything with livestock, cattle especially. And um, after I graduated college with an animal science degree, um, it just led me through um, a couple different avenues and I ended up, I knew I wanted to work with animals so I ended up managing a dairy for five years. And then uh, my fiance and I were looking at opportunities to move back home and that's when I met Bill and Linda, and um, the rest kind of um, fell into place perfect, so. <laughs> How long have you been working here at Crooked Creek? Uh, for three and a half years, I believe. So a lot of these calves, or I shouldn't say calves, the, a lot of the mamas, you've kind of been here since Correct. they were born, yep. right? Correct. So at this farm, um, any animal with an eight in front of its name, born in, or in front of its number, born in 2018, um, I raised and have been here through it all so so we, we are seeing that your tags and you mentioned mm -hmm. the first so if the first number is a six they were born in 2016 that's correct mm -hmm. so what does the other numbers mean uh, so it kind of goes in order so like the calves born this year um, the first one is 100 and then the next one is 101 102 103 so on and so forth and it's just a way to um, just identify and give everyone a different number so so you get to kind of be in charge of, of the babies here. Yes. And the calves that we're seeing in this field were born a couple weeks ago, but mm -hmm. they were born in, in an interesting weather pattern that we had here in Missouri. Uh, can you kind of talk about that experience of what the care of those calves and, and the mamas were yeah. like? So uh, they were, a lot of the calves um, were born during the Arctic, Arctic blast. And so uh, a lot of them were born uh, whenever there was snow out on the ground and it was minus 15 degrees, I think is how, how cold it got. So um, we fortunately had half of our hay barn empty. And so we took a lot of the close and expecting mothers into the hay barn and we have several other barns. And then we also unrolled lots of hay in the pastures and we just watched them very close. Um, it, it, we spent a lot of time with them just watching and, and as soon as the calf was born, we'd get them to the barn and, and get them warmed up. We had to take a couple calves into the house um, and just make sure they had some colostrum in their stomach as soon as they could and uh, and go from there. So we were fortunate that we uh, we had quite a few calves in that, that cold stretch and we didn't lose any. So, That's great. yes. You mentioned colostrum. Can you explain what colostrum is? So colostrum is the uh, the first milk that a mother has. So it's, it's the same in, in humans and, and any other mammal. Uh, it's full of a lot of antibodies and uh, it's very important that the calf gets colostrum within the first however many hours, basically the sooner the better. So, so that's going to kind of set them up to, to be healthy and Correct. all the vitamins mm -hmm. and minerals that they need. Correct. Um, so something we kind of see is you see um, calves nursing. How long are they going to nurse on their mothers for? So normally between six and seven months. And then um, at that point we will wean the calf just to give the mother a break because um, in, in the beef cow world, um, we would like a 365 day calving interval. So we want the cow to have a calf the same time every year. And so that gives um, the mother a quote unquote vacation, if you will, um, for a few months before the next calf comes along. So you're gonna, these mamas are gonna have a calf every year. And, and these cows um, are calving in the spring. Mm -hmm. Why does a farmer choose spring calving versus, or they can have fall calves, mm -hmm. but why do they choose one season or the other? So a lot of farmers, um, they have, will have a herd for the spring and a herd for the fall. And there are benefits to both. Um, for us here at this farm, we have the most forage in the spring and summertime. And so we wanna get these calves born in February so that you know, by April, they're able to start eating a little grass and then they can grow all summer. Um, and, and the other plus is that if you have a spring herd and a fall herd, um, it kind of splits everything up a little bit. So you're not having everything all at once and it's, you know, every six months you're basically doing it over again, so. 
Can you walk us through the, the growth stages of these calves and, and what happens as they grow and mature and then kind of where they go on the farm? Yeah, so, you know, these calves, they're, a lot of them are three weeks to a month old now, and they'll stay on their moms until this fall. And then from here, we will wean them. And it's, we basically, we put them right across the fence from their mom. So they have, you know, they're able to, to look at their mom and talk to their mom. It's just, they're not able to nurse their mom. So that takes away the want and the need for milk, essentially. And then from there, we will um, we'll keep these calves uh, through the winter, give them their vaccinations, everything else. And the male calves will go to one pen and the female calves go to another pen. Um, and next spring, then whenever they're about 14 months old, we'll do a pre-breeding exam, which is we have the veterinarian come in and they check to make sure the heifer has all the right parts and they do measurements and everything and make sure everything is sound. And then when they're about 15 months old, we will artificially inseminate them so that they will have their first calf right around two years old. Why would a farmer choose artif like AI or artificial <coughs> insemination um, over having a bull mm -hmm. in with the heifers and the cows? So um, if you decide to artificially inseminate or AI um, an animal, you can use any bull in the world, essentially. And you know, they, they freeze the semen and they ship it right to you. And so that way we can get the most superior genetics. So like on the Herefords, um, some of the bulls we're using are from Tennessee or Montana or you know, different states. Um, and they should be some of the best in the breed. And it allows us to you know, just make that animal more superior. It opens up your gene pool. Absolutely. It's probably a little more cost effective, I would imagine, than, yeah. than mm -hmm. feeding a bull right. all the time. Right. <laughs> you mentioned <clears throat> vaccinations. Correct. What are the vaccinations? Why do you give them to the cattle? And, and how does that kind of play into the overall care of your animals? So uh, we have a, a strict vaccination protocol. Uh, we vaccinate for things such as black leg, um, respiratory, um, and also pink eye, uh, some other uh, different diseases that cattle can get. And I think uh, in the last year, we've all learned the importance of vaccines and why we vaccinate. And it's just to give that animal a little more um, um, coverage or insurance to make sure that there's no chance if we're moving them somewhere else that they can pick up some sort of germ or virus or bacteria and get sick. So. Yeah. And, and all of those diseases, um, black leg, bovine respiratory, mm -hmm. those are all serious <coughs> yeah. and can take the cow's life. If Absolutely. It's not bad. So you're just kind of making sure you're being yeah. and so, responsible. Right. And so these calves, they'll get their first vaccine uh, when they're about two months old. And then um, whenever we wean them in about six months, they'll get a booster and then another booster in another month after that. So we just want to make sure that the animal has plenty of coverage and the the mother cows they will get a booster annually so they were running <laughs> um so you spent you spend every day with these cows and and they they know you you know them but how do you know when a calf or a heifer or a cow is starting to come down with something or or start mm -hmm. to show some signs of um, maybe sickness so uh, cows are very social and they really like being around each other and so when you're looking out here if you ever see an animal that's potentially off by themselves and not interacting or whenever you go to feed them some grain or some hay and they normally come up and they don't come up that's a pretty good sign that maybe something's going on and just um, it's something to keep an eye on um, also uh, droopy ears um, you know they, if they just look sad if that makes sense yeah. Um, or you know their eyes could be a little sunken if they're dehydrated. Uh, a lot of different different tools um, just to watch for. Mm -hmm. So we, you spend every day with these cows, yes. and they they know you. They see your truck coming, and yes. they know you're coming, and they they get excited to be yes. fed. Um, what do you feed them? other than the forage that they have in their fields? So uh, right now you can see there's not much grass growing. It's, right. it's trying to, but we're not there yet. Still early. Yeah. And so uh, right now they're still eating some hay and then we've been supplementing them because right now they have a lot of, um, their nutrient requirement is fairly high because they're, you know, they just had a new calf. They're producing milk for this new calf. And so right now these cows are getting three pounds a day of, it's a distillers based cube. So dry distillers. Mm -hmm. Um, 
anyways, and it, it seems like um, we've had really good luck with that. And uh, just a little bit of supplement here and there can really help them get along until we have green grass here. So because they have, correct me if I'm wrong, but because they have had a calf recently, they mm -hmm. need a higher ca caloric intake or yes. more calories. That's right. So that they can produce the milk and, and have the energy exactly. to, to take care of the Yeah. Grass. And so um, we also, um, you know, in about three months, we will expect these cows to be in good enough body condition that they will breed back again for a calf next year. You know, so it's, um, yeah. You're asking a lot out of them. Yes. <laughs> how old are, and I know there's different ages, but mm -hmm. how old um, are most of these moms? And how old can they be to, is there a certain age where they can't have a calf anymore? So, yeah, like you said, um, we've got a lot of three-year-olds in this group, and then they move on up. I think the oldest one in this group is 10 years old. Um, oldest cow on the farm right now, uh, she'll be 15 this year. Um, so the biggest limiting factor in our environment is teeth. Um, as a cow gets older, you know, they only have teeth on their bottom. And so as, as they get older, uh, they're more apt to lose a tooth. And if they lose a tooth or the teeth get too short, it's hard for them to eat grass. And so that's the biggest limiting factor. Otherwise, you know, as long as they keep their teeth and, and stay in good condition, you know, they can live for a long time. The, the motto of this farm is from conception to consumption. Mm -hmm. What timeline does that look like um, to, to raise a calf all the way from they hit the ground, they're born to consumption? What, what does that typically look like? So the, the male calves here that we will end up um, castrating and turning into steers because they don't have the genetics that we possibly want in the future or the say the phenotype they're not they're not built how we want them essentially right. um, they will after we wean them they will go on to um, feed and then normally between 13 and 16 months they'll be finished and ready to go to be harvested so the the females or the the bulls that will be held for breeding they will be here on the farm how much longer? Um, if Does the, it just depends? It just depends, yeah. You know, uh, we'll get to a certain point where we'll have, say, say we have, you know, 30 females and we only need to keep 15 of them back, you know, so we could possibly try to sell those extra females as breeding stock or seed stock, as Bill mentioned earlier, uh, to another farmer who might be looking for more cattle. So, as part of farm manager, mm -hmm. you guys, you get to have a lot of different responsibilities and one of them is kind of keeping track of the farm and, and the number of cows here, but how do you decide what cows will stay here and what cows um, that you may sell off to other farms or um, harvest for meat in later years? So uh, with the cows, um, a lot of it has to do with um, potentially uh, them staying within our certain calving window that we want. So like this group, the calving window is from, you know, basically the 1st of February through the end of April or 1st of April, somewhere in there. So if a cow next year, whenever we have the veterinarian here with the ultrasound, preg checking them, if they don't fit that certain window, uh, we could possibly sell them to another farmer to possibly fit into their breeding program. Um, and then also uh, part of it is age, um, attitude, um, confirmation. You know, like uh, if we have a cow who say ends up getting a long toe and, and can't get around very good, um, that might be one that we can end up taking to the sale barn eventually or, or, you know, moving her elsewhere. So you talked about attitude, and mm -hmm. I think this is an interesting um, thing that we, that we, as a farmer, we, we need to look at in cattle. Right. Um, because there's farm accidents all the right. time with cattle, um, charging a farmer mm -hmm. or pinning him down, and countless farmers die every year in cattle related deaths. So can you kind of talk to us about what attitude you look for in these cows um, that you want to that you want to breed back because it is a genetic trait right. so we want to breed happy cows. So right. Kind of what do you look for? So um, most or some other cows can be a little bit protective right when their calf is born. Right. Um, however we don't want them so protective that they're going to hurt someone. And so, like you said, it is very genetic. You know, if you can have a, if a mother is, is very um, mean, essentially a mean cow, um, her daughter, there's a good chance she's gonna be the same way. Um, and so that's something that we want them to uh, come up to us when we go in there and not try to ever come after us or anything like that. 
Um, and I really like a docile cow that you can easily walk around, like so I can walk out in the pasture and walk around them and they're calm with us there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is, is how they're raised. You know, if they're raised around people, the majority of them, you know, you won't have any issues. In these embryo calves, mm -hmm. um, is there a way when you when you buy the the embryo or the um, egg to know what that mom's attitude is like? Uh, so there are um, on their EPDs there are like genetic profiles where uh, DNA has been done before um, on the mother or the father of the embryo, and uh, you can look on there and it'll tell you the likelihood that they will be um, docile or less docile, if that makes sense. Docility, it's a docility score that is done on the animal and then, um, you know, it's um, potentially definitely genetic, so. What does EPD stand for and what is, what is an EPD? So EPD is, stands for estimated progeny difference. And so it is, um, it used to be only based on, it was on paper and it was a plus or minus. Um, and basically when you had a, a, a cow and a bull you put those numbers together and average them, and that's what the animal will be. Uh, today we do, um, we send off DNA, so we'll do um, just a hair sample or blood sample, and then they can run that and have the reliability of that, so how accurate that is. Um, and now also performance can um, enhance the EPDs or potentially take away from them too. And so people look through and they, they want, you know, really high weaning weight or yearling weight or birth weight. So there are only certain bulls whenever we are artificially inseminating that we'll use on heifers. And it has to do with their calving ease or, or how likely their um, calves are to be small. So the EPD really gives you guys um, kind of an indicator of what's to come in the future of that offspring. Correct, correct. And it's, um, it's a tool, it's not foolproof, it's not 100% but it is something that um, a lot of farmers use and look at um, to try to give them an idea of basically what they're getting. So.